Here I am with some of the Better Call Saul creative team. I'm at Nobler Gold Derby, joined by Melissa Bernstein, who is a director on the show, and Thomas Schnauz and Gordon Smith, who are writers and directors. And all three serve as executive producers on the show. And I just want to start off by asking you three, what's the most audacious thing you wrote for the first half of the final season of Better Call Saul. Uh, we'll kick things off with... Uh, I, think, I feel like I should start. No. Yeah, why not? <laughs> no. I'll let what, the writers talk. Let the writers start. Uh, Gordon, uh, why don't we kick off with you? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the most audacious thing that I wrote was um, the death of uh, Nacho Varga, Ignacio Varga, our, our character. Um, you know, it's a, as 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 we all say, it's a team sport. So we were all involved with that process. I I don't share all the blame, uh, but it was my my script and my my script that I uh, wrote and directed. Uh, so I, I killed off poor poor Nacho, but hopefully uh, gave him an exit that uh, he deserved. That that uh, gave him some dignity in the end. Tom. The most audacious thing I don't. We do a lot of things that other shows don't do. Uh, you know, starting off. You know, just talking about my episode 607 is starting off with a five minute piece about how Lalo takes a shower and travels mm -hmm. the sewers is pretty strange. I mean, there's, there's so many things that we show that I think other shows would uh, either not think of doing or, or edit out for, you know, this is uh, this is a lot of, you know, pipe laying one person traveling uh, here, here to there. But it's all we you know, we always love process. That's something that, uh, you know, and I'm breaking bad Vince always was very interested in process and I think he passed that down to the rest of us. Though I would say watching Tony Dalton take a shower is not an, un <laughs> an unpopular choice. It was very short. It was only like 10 seconds. I've got hours of footage. I just, I just right. filmed and filmed. I said, keep more soap, Tony. You know, I just, we were there for a long time. <laughs> That's a oh. that's a better answer than my answer. I think I'm gonna I, I would I'm gonna revise mine to say mine was shooting oh. two minute shot of a flower. <laughs> there you go. There's an opening that yeah that very uh, you don't see that on a lot of other shows. What Gordon did there it was very yeah. very cool and unique. Mm. What's uh, Melissa? What's the most audacious thing you shot? Um. Uh. Well, I think in in my episode this season we we got to do both create Germany in a, you know, in a pretty substantial way, uh, both with uh, Werner Ziegler's uh, widow's home and uh, with the bar uh, sequence too. So creating Germany in, Al in Albuquerque, I think was definitely <laughs> challenging and, and bold. And uh, and then we we had a great fight sequence, you know, um, Hamlin and uh, Jimmy go at it. They're, the gloves are on. And that was not something I would have ever anticipated happening in the show. Like, it's just such a kind of a crazy thing to write into a season. Um, and uh, and that it was a, a lot of fun to shoot. But I think we, I, I was I was taken by surprise when I read the script. I just realized we had an episode called Gloves Off and we totally could have had a Gloves you know. On episode. Yes. Damn it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> had the whole and thing going on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh <laughs> didn't you also melissa am i wrong didn't you also have to shoot the boxing sequence while you were shooting the the epox or the acrylic sequence at the same time on different yeah. stages yeah the the teaser um we were shooting the teaser and the boxing scene at the same time we were in a like a pretty big pro on a pretty big property not our home stage but we did it in two different sections um where matt cradle our who's usually our a camera operator was the dp on on the teaser and Marshall Adams was the DP on the fighting. Uh, so it was, yeah, it was like a, at least a two ring circus. Now gloves on would have been a great episode title, but this season, each of the episodes are titled something and something else. So it would have completely ruined that, that <laughs> flow. Uh, do, do, who, who comes up with those uh, that who, who came up with that idea of the episode titles all it had to have been peter yeah. wanting to do yeah i don't know i couldn't tell you why there was the end connection between everything but it, mm -hmm. uh he just like the first season everything ended in oh 
yeah. for some reason that I still don't know. Uh, we have and in this season. So you have to talk to Peter about that. I, 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 think, I think Vince was part of that too. I think he fell oh. with, with that idea also. They, you know, Wine and Roses is our first one. And that song, you know, well, you, well it's a, a song in a movie and, um, and it really, it has a mood and an atmosphere that really represents the season, especially the first half of the season. Um, and I think that like, and I mean, you guys talked about it so much in the room, maybe you could speak to that, but it's, uh, it definitely, I think that kicked it off. Yeah, we, we've been talking about Days of Wine and Roses for a long time. Whenever we talk about Kim and Jimmy being addicted to the scam, it was just, a, you know, our reference point was Days of Wine and Roses as as a, a couple addicted to alcohol. Uh, they were the very much the same as those characters. Now, we see in the seven episodes of the final season, uh, Kim and Jimmy meticulously plan D-Day and going through all the steps when you were, and they need to get everything just right. And they're all, when you're approaching the final season of a series like Better Call Saul, how meticulous does the planning need to be? And how much does the process mirror Kim and Jimmy's process for D-Day? I mean, you, you should talk, correct me if I'm, if you, if you disagree, Tom, I, I feel like we, we stole a lot from our process towards what their process is even you have the the board or a replica of our board behind you i can see and like that was you know we we, we kind of worked that way with our index cards um so we kimified it because kim is much more post-it noty um but we felt like they we were pitching all these things we were coming up with all, way more scams and way more things that could work but then we had to sort of figure out what's the streamline what's the what's the smart way to do this what's the the, the, the minimum application of force that has the maximum amount of effect. And so in order for us to do it, we felt like they need something to, to tie that together. They need to figure out something to keep track of. Um, and we felt like uh, hiding it in the, the, land, the ugly landscape portrait uh, was a fun nod to something that's always been there um, that we've made a lot of jokes about in the course of the years, <laughs> so. Yeah, we, we we let them settle on pictures instead of the the careful wording like we do, so that when the audience sees it, they don't know exactly what's happening. But we could tell that those two have a plan that we don't quite understand. And if anybody finds this mess of no cards, they're not really going to make heads or tails of it. Which I mean, even just making that was super meticulous because it was like it, I think it, it first appeared in episode three. We'd been talking about it, and so uh, the our 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 brain trust of, of staff and assistants helped kind of figure out like what are some options. And then I, I kind of helped guide that. And then we sent it to Peter and then we sent it to all the other people who had to sort of weigh in on like what was involved and what, when it should develop, what, what images, what images were evocative enough, but not tipping our hand enough. So like it was, it was a huge process of just coordinating. And then it moves to Albuquerque with the, with the props team and, our directors and the DPs trying to figure out the show, the best, you know, the best way to tell a visual story with it. Mm. Yeah. And how does your planning sort of process work, Melissa? How, once you've been given this script and you know sort of what you're approaching, how do you make sure everything gets done in a way it needs to get done? And was it different for this final sort of collection of episodes? Was there a different approach to usual or is it the same sort of thing? It's the same, it's the same approach um, and the same approach, you know, we, we kind of got into our groove on Breaking Bad and we've definitely used the same model. Um, it is extremely meticulous and Kim, as you said, is extremely meticulous. So she fits very well into our world, but like we just, we have a lot of meetings, you know, we, we start with a big concept meeting where all the department heads get together and we talk through the script scene by scene. And we talk, you know, with the writer and the director involved and we're talking through like, what is in our mind's eye, what's on the page, what the challenges are. And like, and that's the first big meeting. And we, and then we start, and then we get into smaller meetings with the departments as we go, we start location scouting, we start bringing the actual locations into the process. We, um, 
we and then you know shot listing begins and we then we have another meeting which is like a which we call a tone meeting where a smaller group of us get back together and go through the script again scene by scene talking about intention talking about what's on the page what's not on the page how these episodes connect to other episodes uh where where our characters heads are at um what uh, our actors might be what what their issues might be like we talk about everything and then we go back and we have another we have a big production meeting again with all the department heads we go through everything our ad's run that meeting and we talk through how we're going to op, you know actually accomplish everything prior to that we've had a tech scout where as many of us as possible have gone to the locations and like looked at where the truck's going to go and you know how, what how's the lighting going to work and so we're just constantly uh, getting together and talking about what is on our docket. And then we're also trying to think ahead, you know, as we know, like bigger set pieces are coming or things that are complicated are coming our way. We try to get ahead of them. Like um, the oil tanker in Gordon's episode, like none of us, had done, how are we going to take Michael Mando and put him safely in a vat of <laughs> oil? Uh, and like, how, how are we, we could all imagine it, but like, how do you do that? Um, how do you do that safely? And so uh, we- My first pitch was, you know, mineral oil in a kiddie pool, but it just felt like that was off tonally. So we we had to refine it. It was a little abstract, but yeah. you know, there there was merit. Yeah. Uh, uh, Gordon and Tom, with the writing, uh, did, did you, as you approach this final season, do you start at the end point and work backwards or like how, how, did, how did that all play together or, or something different? You know, we broke this story probably two years ago because I, I have a phone, my phone will update me. Here's, here's what you were doing uh, this month in 2001. And it's I, all I get is pictures of note cards because <laughs> I was I was we did everything over Zoom and I was writing writing the cards. I take a picture of them, send them off to Jen Carroll. She'd put them on a share board that we could all see over Zoom. So all I have is all these pictures of note cards. Um, but uh, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> well, do, do you start at the did you start, oh, do we start at the, the end and where you wanted yeah. to land and I go think we, backwards? Oh. I think we knew that we had to get to a point where Jimmy and Kim won um, by tricking uh, Howard, but it had to be in a way because Howard's so smart he's going to figure it all out. So it had we had to get to an end point where even if Howard figured it out, it was too late. It was so the idea of this mediation of all, everything heading towards this mediation. Was something that came up probably earlier but all the steps then we went back to the beginning and started thinking let's make him look like a drug addict and but as we were doing that then we were like get got to a point of okay we've laid these things in where the kettlemans come in and and cliff sees a prostitute thrown out of howard's car well cliff is going to say something so what do we do then and that's when the detective came in who is on jimmy's side so there was you know we went we had an endpoint kind of, then we went back to the beginning and started going, as we like to call it, brick by brick. Yeah. And I think yeah. the other thing I would add to that is just, is was, I think in my memory, we had a hope, we we, we had a hope that the, the, the Cliff storyline and the Lalo storyline were going to meet, but we had to figure out the timing of that. And then also just, did it make sense and keep, kept kicking the tires to make sure that it's like, no, this, these two things, we knew for years we've been like these two storylines, uh, the the sort of cartel of Jimmy and the other side of Jimmy need to cross, but we didn't know exactly how. And then it was like, uh, how do we, where do we get this? We, I don't think we knew when they were going to cross. I don't think we, we knew when, we weren't sure for a while and how, how long it was going to be to get to, that whether it was going to be episode seven or nine or, or where that was going to happen. But, uh, but then we did. Mm. And I think the the mid season sort of finale, the sort of halfway point of the season, is a really nice spot for that to land in. Um, Gordon, what is um, what's the biggest? And Tom, you can uh, chime in here too. What's the biggest disagreement that you guys have had in the writers' room? I mean, I feel like biggest disagreement. We we're not. I don't know. We're all pulling the oars in the same direction. I feel like yeah. we, we really. I, even when we everyone has different tastes everyone has different things that that work for them or don't work for them but we all you you know that it's good faith like i don't think anybody's had a moment where it's just like that's stupid why are you trying to ruin the show like it, it's it's usually like 
ah, you know, I, I wonder if there's this. And you, you know, sometimes we hold on to those things and like something really bothers you. So you just try and make sure that it's, it's heard because you know in your gut that like somebody else is going to be bothered by it. But I don't know, in, in my memory, it's not, it's not that, it's, it's fairly supportive. It's not that acrimonious. Uh, I mean, Tom personally dislikes me, but beyond that, like as a professional, it's, it's fine. When I think um, of Gordon, I just, <laughs> <laughs> well, so I, lo I, I love Gordon. Yeah. <laughs> to reframe that, like, um, what was the thing that was the hardest thing for you as a, a crew of writers to nut out? What did Thomas? That's so difficult. I mean, it's so hard to say what was the hardest thing to do. I mean, it's just, we have a, you know, our processes, we, we put up an idea board and we have ideas that go, maybe this will happen in episode seven and eight or nine, and then things either go away or come together. And it's just, you know, I, the, this season was hard because it was over zoom and we all, you know, when we want to talk, we used to just kind of, have a conversation and talk to each other and overlap each other. And this way the technology didn't allow it. So we'd sit there like this for 10 minutes while somebody else spoke and wait your turn or wait for Peter to say, oh, Tom has something to say or whatever. And that that to me was extremely difficult. It was just, just it was really mentally draining. <laughs> so that that was the hardest thing to do. As far as plot, that was hard to, to do. I think, you know, I can't, I think trying to come together with Breaking Bad in a satisfying way. And that's, I think that's to come. So we haven't seen that yet. So I don't really want to talk about that. Okay. Fair enough. We'll, we'll talk about it uh, after the next seven episodes of it. Uh, Melissa, uh, Breaking, uh, no, not Breaking Bad. Better Call Saul has done really well with Emmy nominations over um, its, its history, maybe as well as any show. It's been nominated for Best Drama Series every single season. It's been on the air. Uh, haven't been able to win any yet, <laughs> Better Call Saul. I don't know what's been going on there. Um, but something that surprised me is, because you've done so well with uh, nominations, is that I don't believe there's been a nomination for cinematography on the show Um in its run and it's got such a distinct look and visual and there's such sort of unique and interesting camera angles that like tell the story and the framing um how do you as the director uh melissa approach that sort of visual style of the show and make sure that the look of better call Saul is different to anything else on tv well, I mean, I think that's largely, uh, you know, Marshall Adams and Paul Donaghy, our DPs are responsible for that. Um, you know, we've had like big picture conversations with them and uh, Vincent Peter from the beginning, you know, just talking about, you know, a, a reference points and like things that uh, like looks that we like, things that we don't like so much and, um, and, and like talk about ideas and, you know, how can we innovate? Um, something that started on Breaking Bad with Vince is like, he just, you know, he's always been somebody who likes to see something he isn't seeing a lot of. Um, like, because it just like, you you know, as he'll say, like too much hot fudge on your hot fudge Sunday, like it's just, it's too, even if though it's hot fudge, it's too much. So um, I think we, we do try to do things differently. I think we, we have a lot of faith in our audience in terms of recognizing characters in, in scenes like we, we're not worried oh you can't see you know both of Ray's eyes or you can't make you know or you can only see a, a part you know Jimmy's in the is so, totally silhouetted like we're I think we lean into to those kind of choices um mm -hmm. and I I agree it's I think we feel globally very blessed to be as included in the awards conversation as we have from the get-go uh, there's so many shows in the mix it's 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 actually hard to get your head around and I think we definitely benefited from our roots in Breaking Bad and we're very appreciative that um, people have uh, you know, gave us a chance and then have seen the show for it, you know, as its own piece of art. Um, but I, I think, so I think it's just gratitude and like when Schmin, you know, like, I mean, it, you know, it, it's, oh, it's nice. Speak for yourself. Damn it. I want an, I want an Emmy. Well, only, I think you have joking. some Tom. <laughs> um, don't be, don't be too greedy. Uh, <laughs> 
but I, you know, the cinematography, Marshall Adams, one of our DPs, I, he, you know, he was nominated for another show <laughs> last year. So, I mean, like the, I know their work is amazing. It's just kind of, I don't, you know, I, it's hard to get your, get your mind around exactly what makes that happen. I, you know, our production design is amazing. I think our, you know, our makeup and hair is amazing. Our costumes are amazing, but like, it, you know, it's, it's one of those things where Ray Seahorn is amazing and, you know, she hasn't been recognized. And I think um, is somebody, you know, in the, in the very center of our cast, like that we've, you know, like, I think we'd all very much like to see that happen, but like, you know, I think if we look at it on the whole, it's a, uh, it, we, we've, we've been doing really well. Yeah. And something that Melissa just touched on there about how, you know, with the audience, you're very trusting of your audience. I think that uh, flows through into the writing as well. Oh my God. Uh, guys, where, yeah, where like a lot of stuff isn't over explained in Better Call Saul. Like it's sort of, um, which um, is trusting of the audience, not only maybe to fill in gaps, but also um, have their own thoughts about what's going on on the screen and their own sort of theories and stuff. Do either of you guys have like a, favorite um sort of sort of quiet moment on better call Saul which sort of got the audience's heads ticking over hmm. I mean I quiet moments I I go back to an episode I did in season two where where Jimmy's floating in the pool and it was just there's a scene in one flew over the cuckoo's nest where Jack Nicholson is just it's just on his face and he's just thinking and all these thoughts are going through his head and I remember talking to Bob about that particular scene where he's just floating in the pool and he's thinking about his next move and it's before he calls and accepts this, this cush job at, at uh, Davis and Maine. Um, that was a quiet moment that I was happy about. I can't, I'm trying to think of one from this season, which I know there are, but I, it's just not coming to me right now. Oh, that's fine, good. And obviously it's a, it's a very dramatic sequence, but Tom in seven, when, uh, when Howard, is, when he realizes like he finally catches up with what's about to happen to him there's just like you know a few seconds there where patrick the way he's playing this moment of like of of the reality setting in it, it's so subtle and it's so incredible and i love it so much it's one yeah of that I'll, i will say as a, as directors on the show i think we can all agree we have just the best cast i mean we i it's like i feel so hand, i just feel <laughs> <laughs> so lucky I just like I don't I feel like I don't have to do very much directing when I'm there because they 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 rehearse they get together they rehearse these things they come with so many great ideas and it's just you know stand back and let them put the scene on their feet and see what happens and and so many magical things like that moment Melissa talked about it was like not really in the script it was just Patrick reacting to this this gun that shows up suddenly in this this scene that he had complete control over now it's like wait, wait a minute what what is going on and the sense of something really bad is about to happen Mm. I think for me, I, I, there's so many, like you say, there's, there's, I think it happens both in the writing. And I think one of the things that separates the show is like in post we're, we're always going, okay, we, we have a line, we shot it. We it's made it through the draft. Do we need it? No, it, 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 they're doing it. They're, they're doing it. And I, I see it on their faces. Let's just get rid of the line. Let's get rid of the thing that sort of explains it too much. So I, I think in, for me, one of the moments that I, was was not on the page really i mean it, it's there in a very abstract way was um at the end of the phone call that uh, nacho makes to his dad um which is it has a lot of silence in that call it's a lot of they, they it's all the things that they can't say um you know michael mando hangs up the phone as, as the actor and he goes through this just there's just so it, it's this whole range of emotions that lent, ends in a little laugh that's just this desolate sad little laugh and it's like that's the laugh is certainly not something that it's like we would have scripted like it seems funny or something but it's it's in the emotional range and it was such a color that i could not have imagined really but it played so well that we were like no that's that's heartbreaking we gotta we gotta keep that mm. what do for each of you what do you think is the greatest strength of better call soul as a series um melissa Oh, right to me, huh? <laughs> <laughs> or, or if someone else gets in first, they can. Yeah. 
I, I mean, it, I, I, I think the writing is um, spectacular. I and that was and, my answer. I know, and they're not even—they can't even kick me from here. It's a, um, but I, you know, like I, I take a lot of pride in what I do as a producer and as a very, very involved producer. But like, um, I think you know, m me with my collaborators on the ground and all the work we do, we can make, we can elevate things and we can make it better and better and better. But if the script isn't great, there's only so much we can do. <laughs> you know, I, it, it really starts there. Um, it's what inspires us. It's what inspires the actors. It's what inspires the crew is like tearing through those scripts page by page and just these, uh, these, you know, just looking at these flawed complicated characters uh find their way in the world um and and allowing us to immerse ourselves in it um so i unfortunately have to you know take my uh, heart to these guys yeah yeah it's hard they can't just say the directors back to you without also complimenting <laughs> themselves well I do. I, I'm, convenient uh, isn't it yeah yeah <laughs> I, I, I'm going to say I, I can tip back to producers because Melissa does does everything. And, and I think one of the strengths of the show, I think I think our, the, the narrative, one of the narrative strengths of the show is, is our nuance. I feel like nuance, I, I say, is our special effect because it's just getting into the nitty gritty and doing things in a, in a subtle way that's true to the characters. But the reason that we can do that narratively is because I feel like we're, we're we all trust each other a lot. Like we, we all we're like. I know that there's if I have something in the script that's kind of bullshit, Melissa's going to catch it and be like, "What is this?" Or if the if, if, if Melissa's going to push on it, all of the people in production are going to push on it. They're going to push on it so hard and be like, "Really, what does this look like?" You had an idea as a writer in your head, but what is it actually when you try to put this on its feet and make it real? And it, the fact that you can trust that means that all the little things and the new nuance, everything gets better and better and more polished. And I do feel like you know, those those little polishes, those are the things that separate us, I think. Those are the things that other people don't get to do because I think, uh, I don't know why they don't get to do them. They, they, they don't have the same team, I guess. But um, knowing that everyone's got your back and really you're not, no one's competing with you. Everyone's trying to make a great show and like across episodes uh, is, is a real, real boon. Before we go to Tom, uh, Melissa, what is the biggest bit of bullshit that Gordon tried to put into a script <laughs> to call so many I know well I I think his insistence on calling her Viola instead of Viola that's a <laughs> that's some bullshit yeah well yeah no one likes it no one likes and it. we everybody has to get corrected and then we have to be like it's just that it's just Gordon yeah. Gordon yeah <laughs> uh Tom what do you think the greatest strength of Better Call Saul is <laughs> You know, you do, you talk about the producing. I mean, Gordon's right. I mean, just from Peter and Vince, uh, just the team that's assembled is so strong. I mean, we have such good editors, our casting. I mean, it's just, you don't really have to, coming in as a director, really have to worry about any department. Um, it's just strong across the board and everybody is pushing towards the same goal and everyone understands that we don't have to, you know, this sounds bad, cater to the audience. We're not trying to explain things to the audience. We can, we'd be subtle, let them figure things out. We don't have to spell things out. And that's in every department. I mean, in the scenery and, and the casting, everything is you know, hopefully uh, done in a way that we're not showing the audience, here's, here's A to B to C to D. Here's, so you understand it's, it's subtle things. It's you know, Lalo looking at a cockroach and us knowing what exactly that means. I mean, that, maybe that's a little on the nose. I mean, you think people understood what that was, but there's things all throughout the scripts that and the, our editors are just strong enough that they can just hold on a seat and not feel they have to cut to a person speaking. And it's just hold on a wide shot and let things happen. That's, you know, we're again, we're just the, the, the crew that has been assembled here is our strength. And just to piggyback one more, one thing off what you said, Tom, because it reminded me, like to, to, to give an example of like how tight that gets in such departments. We have a greens department, which is the people who are in charge of like plants and, and landscape and stuff. And, you know, it's, which is a subheading of the production department, which is a subheading of the of art department. 
And when we were building the the desert sequence, to build the stage that we shot the, the opening of 603 on, are the they were so invested they showed me so many plants they're like how about this and one of the things that they brought that makes it in is they brought this stuff it's it's native it's called blood stem and it's like it's just a little bit of color and red and it's called blood because this is supposed to tie us to the future but this is what they're thinking about they're thinking about that level of detail of like some twigs that are very small and they're very subtle but they made a difference to, to the overall feel of the shot and 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 they were like really invested in all of those things and uh, you know, it's from from something that somebody might just be like, it's a patch of dirt. You know, what do you, what do you want in it? You know, but they were mm. so invested be, to 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 get it right. Yeah, mm. green greens is a department that does not get enough shout outs because I did this whole in six oh seven this oneer where you're following Jimmy and camera guy out of the classroom and it goes around and we're going around and around. Well, there's a crew there somewhere and it's back behind. There's a building and there were not enough greens there and these guys came and filled it in so that you could put video village and have everything hidden you have a crew standing by because it looks like we're out in the middle of this giant park and there's nobody around well they're there they're just hidden by these amazing <laughs> greens that people brought in and made it look like it's native to the to the area and natural mm. if you guys had to like succinctly summarize what would the th th what is the thematic thing that Better Call Saul's about? What is Better Call Saul thematically about? You had to sort of crystallize it. Jeez, you know, it's like the 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 road to hell is paved with good intentions. I mean, there's, there's so many things, you know, Kim Wexler, I keep using, whenever I have these interviews, using the phrase, she has this, uh, this Robin Hood complex where she feels like she could do things, terrible things, stealing or <laughs> tricking or scamming for good. You know, she's going to take what they do and give it to people who are in need, deserving. She's going to represent poorer people who don't, who can't get a good defense. And that justifies them doing the, the terrible things they did to Howard. And I think, you know, we wanted the audience to be rooting for our guys and look, look at them get over on Howard. And it's so fun. And, you know, Howard's a jerk and blah, blah, blah. And then this terrible thing happens and, and you're kind of in their headspace and and when this moment happens at the end of 607, it's like, oh God, what did we do? <laughs> what is like, not just them, what did we all do? Well, we were all rooting for them to succeed in the scam. And now this has happened. It's, you know, so that's, uh, I didn't really put it succinctly, but that's uh, <laughs> the road to hell is paved with good intentions, I think. Yeah. My yeah. shorter answer. Yeah. So yeah. I thought. Yeah. I think there's a lot of, I, I completely agree with what you're saying, Tom. It just feels like it's some, I'm, I can't, I'm, I'm not that biblically versed, but there's the line about, you know, what, what profited a man to, to gain the world, but lose his soul. And there's some sense of that, that it's like, what is the balance of a, of a person's soul? What's the balance of, of being a good person, even that it's, we, we push on some of those big questions of like, you know, is Jimmy good or bad, or is it what you do? <laughs> you know, like the, the road to hell is certainly paved with good intentions, but like the intentions are good and the actions are bad. So what, what is, where's the crossing point where the effect of that is uh, still good or is it still bad? Or I don't know, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a series of questions. I feel like more than a statement, but. Yeah. yeah. No. It's yeah, breaking it's a great question, but I think breaking bad, it was all like it was all much more in a show I love so much as well, but it was a little bit more straightforward in terms of, you know, like taking Mr. Chips and turning him into Scarface. And then, you know, and then like all the layers of that journey and like and how Walt was put on it. This is just so much messier. Like Jimmy is such a messy person and like, and, and then I think the relationships on the show matter so much. Like it's, it's really not just about this singular arc of, you know, of this devolution of Jimmy to Saul. Mm -hmm. It's real. it's about like how these very flawed, very damaged characters interrelate and like what comes out of the, those relationships. And it's, it's 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 murky mm. and i think, I think, it, I think it tells us about our humanity hopefully yeah i think you're right like i think with breaking bad which is a, a amazing show it was a much clearer sort of like 
good to evil and descent, whereas we're definitely seeing a descent of uh, Kim and Jimmy, but it, it does seem a bit more gray and a bit more like you, you, you know, you want to see maybe some more redemption and different things come into play in their story arc. Um, you guys have obviously had to work on the final season of Better Call Saul. Do, it, do any of you have favourite series finals? Other than Breaking Bad. Okay, you can't, <laughs> you can't say Breaking Bad because some of you had to do that as well. You're, you're asking about other series? The, yeah, the way, another like the series. series yeah. They, they ended? Yeah. I, I'm a Six Feet Under fan. Like, I loved the ending of that show. Is that, is that what we're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah I you, thought you've that answered the correct. question correctly. Yeah. I yeah. like, I, I love the idea. Of, I just thought that was a, like such mm -hmm. a great uh, delivery on their themes and like, you know, and life and death. And I, like, I just, I found it um, visually interesting and really unusual. And um, more recently, I'm a big, I love the way Insecure ended. I think that I thought that was like a great, I love, I love the show so much. It's such a love letter to LA. I love the story about women and about, um, and black characters that, you know, I, I don't think you see all the time and how funny it was and how heart wrenching it was. And, and I thought they did a really nice job. If you look at the pilot and the finale next to one another, I think they relate in a, a really poetic, beautiful way, intentional way. Mm. Gordon, do you have one? Uh, I did love the the finale of Insecure too. That's such a great show. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that they, they managed to, to to pull off a tight wire act. But I more an older show that I like. I actually I didn't the the final season was very rocky, but I I loved the absolute end of The Wire, uh, which is a classic because it, it's just you know McNulty has gone off to to sort of put something right that he did wrong earlier in the season he's going to get this guy that he dropped in like Richmond at a, a homeless shelter and pretended that he died and it's just him and this guy on the side of the road and the traffic going and it's just a it's 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 very much a summation of the show of just like it just keeps rolling the world just keeps rolling um I thought that was a that that last image the last five minutes of that show were just like heartbreaking um I also love the end of the Americans. The Americans was also a sad, sad ending of like, well, my kids are gonna be fine, but I'm gonna be in Russia for the rest of my life, which I felt like was, you know, the comeuppance they kind of deserved. Tom? I am drawing a complete blank. I, for okay. some reason, I, only the bad endings of shows are popping <laughs> in my head. And somehow <laughs> sometimes overwhelming my brain that I can't think of what was a good ending for a TV show that I liked, so. Very sorry. There's so many shows I think, that I love, and I just felt like they, you know, such a Seinfeld fan. But I was like, what the hell happened in the last yeah, I, episode? I think it is rare for a series and so on. I think that was partly why that final season of Breaking Bad got so much acclaim because it is special for a season to end as well as it did and end as strong as it started. Um, either that or it's a really bad show that ends really well and people like it, but they they stop watching the show. Yeah. <laughs> um, brilliant. Uh, guys, what what would um do you each have just from the from the whole series? Do either of you have do any of you have a favorite moment? Great. That's the better call song. Uh, for me, I would say because it was the first episode I directed for Better Call Saul, that episode and, this, and the confrontation between Chuck and Jimmy, when Jimmy realizes that Chuck has gone behind his back and, and torpedoed his chances of getting a job at HHM and they have it out. It's a, you know, you're, you're like a chimp with machine gun. That, that moment to me was felt like when I was directing it that I felt like really good about where where I, I was as a writer director just felt like watching those guys those you know Odenkirk and McKeon going at it I it was just I just felt really good so that's one of my favorite moments of the show yeah uh, Gordon my 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 my, oh, oh, Melissa. my, favorite, Melissa, my, my favorite thing is that Bob lived uh after his heart attack and thrived yeah. and oh yeah and that too can I add that <laughs> Yeah. No, you can't. You can't. No, you can't change your thing. No, nope. nope. and, and don't start throwing out finales now either. We're, we're uh, <laughs> nope. Clearly, you are now on record. You don't care about Bob's heart attack. 
Uh, uh, Gordon, uh, yeah, Gordon, do you have a favorite role? I mean, it's it's uh, the, there's the show as it airs, and then there's like the show that we lived, and it's interesting because it's like I've lived a lot of. There's been a, this has been a monumental show for my life, uh, and and just a lot of ch changes and things that have happened. You know, these are my. Uh, so I have, I have a sentimental feeling about the show. You know, uh, mm -hmm. I I think one of my favorite memories is when we were shooting my first episode, uh, which was my first episode of television, which was the Mike episode we did in season one. Mm -hmm. And like it, we kept getting, we, we were trying to shoot the scene, the, a bunch of these scenes that were in Philadelphia. We just kept getting rained out. There's a, there's a heavy monsoon season in Albuquerque. So I just remember sitting there in the back of a van with lightning coming down and rain going, well, I almost made an episode. <laughs> like just, oh, maybe we'll get through this. Just like, it just kept seeming like I was cursed and it was just not going to happen. And then it, you know, it turned, it, it, it turned out, yeah. okay, but, but it was, I, I tried, I tried to keep him off the show and he somehow weaseled his way in. So, you know, <laughs> he had a lot of forces okay. against him and somehow he prevailed. Yeah. Tom, Tom forgot to lock the back door of the office, which was how I got in. So. Yeah. Uh, or, we, or slipping, we, that's a slipping Jimmy move. Yeah. Yeah. We had our, um, one of our, our tech scouts with Vince. Called, we turned into tech apocalypse where we had just like so much rain that like we were we were just and it, it's murder valley where mm -hmm. uh where uh gordon single-handedly decided to murder uh, michael mando's character even though we told him not to um it's that same place we had to, you know we, when we went there earlier seasons and it was like new mexico can just like come out of nowhere and mm -hmm. and it's it's the most like insane visceral experience where like you're just sort of you you, you can't combat nature but you're in awe of it and it's 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 actually it's something really spectacular about shooting there and like i hope i hope you know the, i hope people get the chance to do that because it's it's incredible this time like a bridge washed out and we were like trying to get back to our bus and like our pregnant yeah. ad anna remy borden was like leading the charge with like not you know no, not pausing in any way, shape, or form. Like the, the whole thing was insane, but it was actually yeah. just like the feel of our show. I think that was. we do we do have the two guys with the most blood on their hands this season with us today. Because uh, Gordon, the end of the episode you wrote and directed that Joe got killed, and Tom, the episode you wrote and directed ended with uh, uh, Howard getting killed. So uh, you you guys some very dramatic moments to end your episodes. Uh, for sure. Uh, thank you so much for spending time chatting with us today, all of you. Uh, people watching this interview can go to, or this panel, sorry, I should say, can go to goldderby.com to make your own award predictions. And all the best of luck to any Amy voters watching for your consideration for the first part of the final season for this year's Emmy Awards. Thanks for your time, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thanks so much. Thanks, Matt. No worries.